Good afternoon. Welcome to the Pervasive Media Studios online lunchtime talk. These are live every Friday at 1 p.m. beaming out onto your smartphones, laptops, iPads and living room televisions. My name is Martin O'Leary and I'm the Pervasive Media Studios creative technologist. These talks are our chance to throw open the digital doors of the Pervasive Media Studio and for you to hear more from the people who are part of our community or who are working on things that excite us. Especially big welcome to those of you who are new to the studio for whom this may be the first time you're engaging with us. For all of you newcomers, here's a little bit about what we do. The Pervasive Media Studio is a diverse and collaborative community exploring creativity and technology, everything from comedy to coding, product development to performance art. We're a partnership between Watershed, the University of the West of England and the University of Bristol. We're a home for early ideas, companies and a meeting place of both the creative and commercial industries. We're a studio space, uh, offering desk space, meeting rooms, events and opportunities, all for free for our residents. And we're a safe space for artists to take risks in their practice and make time for collaboration. We're running a slightly abbreviated schedule this week because at 1.45 we're going to be pointing you over to the Southwest Creative Technology Network's data showcase, where there's a conversation happening about data and the environment, which I think is very relevant to this week's talk. We'll put the link to that in the chat once uh, we're done. But what is this week's talk? Well, we're joined by studio resident and winner of the 2020 Ivor Novello Award for Sound Art, Kathy Hind. She'll be talking about her attempts to rewild water data, and she'll share sounds, images, and experiences from her encounters with water watery environments. Kathy will be sharing some audio pieces, so if you've got headphones, please uh, go and grab them now. Also, some of the video she'll be sharing contains flashing images, and she'll flag that as it comes up. There's going to be a Q&A at the end with the talk running at around about 30 minutes. If you want to ask any questions, pop them into the chat window and I'll pick them out to ask Kathy. Or if you like, you can tweet your questions to at PM Studio UK. A captioned version of the talk will be available here after the talk is finished. Now, before we start, I want to let you know that there's no talk next week because it's Easter, but we'll be back in two weeks time with Watershed's very own Zoe Raspash. She'll be talking about climate justice, a transformation to a green and equal society, and about the role of the arts and culture in achieving those goals. You can get news on all of our future <coughs> talks by following us on at PM Studio UK on Twitter, at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram, or subscribe to our newsletter on our website. Don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel, press the button, give the video a thumbs up. The more subscribers we get, the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. Please feel free to share the link now on any of your <coughs> socials. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Cathy. Great, thanks very much, Martin, and thanks for everyone for coming along. So today in my talk, Listening to Water, I'm gonna present some ideas around the research I've been doing on my fellowship, the Southwest Creative Technology Network, focusing on data, along with 23 other fellows from different disciplines. My aim was to research methods to experience water data sets by applying methods from my artistic practice. And I named my research project, Rewilding Water Data. So according to the Rewilding Europe website, rewilding is a progressive approach to conservation. It's about letting nature take care of itself, enabling natural processes to shape land and sea, repair damaged ecosystems and restore degraded landscapes. Three rewilding wildlife's natural rhythms create wilder, more biodiverse habitats. So I tried to think about rewilding while researching in the sense of letting things happen, working with emergence and opting for less control and intervention, and maybe by embracing the agency of non-human others and trying to think about experiencing different kinds of knowledge. So in terms of approaching this through my artistic practice, um, within my practice, I search for embodied methods to encourage the emergence of knowledge through durational process-led enactments. And I'm interested in how we might encounter water data and experience it together, and perhaps to not actually gather it, extract it or harvest it, but to be with it and to encounter it in a more abstracted way that maybe isn't necessarily about answering a question, but could create a context to ask new questions we hadn't thought of before. And these approaches echo the ways I approach making installations, composing and performing. I often work with open scores, which in music is a score that isn't fixed and it has some flexibility and can be the starting point for improvisation. And I create installations that have generative behaviors that are not fixed. And I build myself musical instruments that are not possible to fully control, 
which encourages an evolving dialogue when performing and stimulates improvisation. So water has actually been really present in my artwork for a long time. And so in this talk, I'm gonna try and outline three different approaches to listening to water. And the first is a piece I made a few years ago called Tipping Point, which was commissioned by the arts organization Cryptic in 2014. But I want to revisit this piece because I feel it follows the kind of trajectory that I'm gonna go on to talk about with my data fellowship. So the motivation to make this piece came about thinking about balancing of the world's water cycle and perhaps more around concerns of imbalance from water shortages and droughts to flooding. Um, and noticing these extremes are happening more often and becoming amplified due to the climate crisis and ecological breakdown. Scientific data and statistics are really important to help understand what is happening and important for pressuring governments to act for climate justice. However, as concerned individuals, it can sometimes be difficult to find a way to respond to the enormity of this information, which can often be overwhelming. Um, so this installation, the title is Tipping Point, which is intentionally loaded and refers to climate tipping points, where changes meet a point of no return and escalate and accelerate, like Arctic ice melts. The piece itself is sparse and minimal, and it creates a space for spending long durations being immersed in a listening experience. And the installation encourages people to focus on just a shifting water level and a kind of fragile balancing act. So before I show a short video, I'll just explain briefly how it works. And um, firstly, I had the immense pleasure to work with the incredibly talented scientific glassblower, John Rowden at Bristol University, where I worked for about three months in the glass workshop in the School of Physics. And the installation is constructed of six pairs of glass vessels, and each pair shares a body of water. And I constructed a slowly moving motorized arm that tips from one side to the other, with a silicon tube that allows water to flow from one glass to the other. As they tip, one fills and the other empties and vice versa. And rather than design and compose sound for the installation, I decided to resonate the glasses using audio feedback. So the empty space in each glass tunes the feedback to the resonant frequency of the empty space. And this works because there's a microphone inside each glass, which is routed to a speaker external to the glass. And it, it kind of works on the same principle as when you blow over the top of a glass bottle which is then tuned by the amount of water that is in it. And to help with this part of it, I collaborated with the programmer, Matthew Oldham, who wrote some software that listens to the feedback and then balances the microphone gain. So it's just at the point of feeding back, which is also a delicate balancing point and a potential tipping point. The insulation is shaped by a generative sequence where the number of live microphones changes and the probability as to whether the motor is on or off it also has levels of randomness. So this installation produces a constantly shifting soundscape that never repeats, and it sometimes surprises me. We can watch a short video of this, please, next. the installation live by controlling the motors and switching the microphones on and off and I approach this partly as an improvisation because the water moves very slowly so whatever I change and shift I then need to wait and listen carefully to the implications of the change that I've made becomes audible and this also relates to the delay responses to something like CO2 in the atmosphere where some of the effects are yet to be experienced but the triggers have already happened when I perform with it, there is a focus on discovering through doing and listening, and it explores sonic phenomena, which is important to me that I'm not creating the sound directly, 
but I've set up conditions from which a soundscape can emerge. It's also a sonification of data. The empty space is being sonified and the tone of the sound is a description of the empty space within the glass. But there is an added complexity in how all these sounds then interact with each other and the other sounds in the room. So there is some instability and fragility, and I also want this to be sensed and picked up on by the people visiting the installation. So it's sensitive and it responds to its environment. And it's also quite quiet and moves very slowly and demands a kind of slowing down of focus and a listening for longer durations to find these changes. So this piece is very much about listening and tuning the ears and experiencing sound as a phenomena, as it is happening, as it is coming into being, and it's not the playback of a composition or a sequence, it is actually inherently live. So I'm gonna move on to talking about listening to water part two. Um, and this is perhaps much more explicitly listening to water, but from a less common perspective, from underwater, using underwater microphones called hydrophones. So I work with sound and I often practice on location field recording or even just listening. And when I'm field recording and listening through different kinds of microphones, I find that I can listen in many different ways. And I consciously try and shift my perception to focus on different frequencies or textures and densities within the sound, searching to uncover sounds that I didn't perhaps notice when I first tuned in. And I can almost make a composition like this by shifting my modes of listening and attention. In everyday life, we often filter our listening, especially when listening to speech, because when we listen to speech, it's, it's a different kind of way of listening because we are decoding information and the definite goal and an aim to understand. So, but for me, this act of field recording is a way to break this habit of instinctively filtering and to try and form new habits of unfiltered listening. And listening with hydrophones actually encourages this even more. And it's like exercising or practicing listening and searching. And some underwater sounds are really quiet. And sometimes it's like listening to pure white noise. And sometimes it's almost silent. And there's something special about this process of focused listening for long durations, which deeply connects me with a location. And my awareness is heightened as are my concerns around climate change and environmental issues. So for some time, I've been organizing listening walks as a way to share this process of field recording and active listening with others to create a situation that can help us build a deeper connection with the planet through the act of shared listening. And these walks typically follow a stream, a river, a body of water with pauses to listen together using hydrophones. So on this slide, you can see me launching a hydrophone into a bog with wild abandon. And I'm listening to a really amazing location, the flow country in the north of Scotland, which is an area of blanket bog formed from rare mosses that need to be waterlogged in order to form peat. In the past, it has been a greatly misunderstood landscape, but there's been a more recent raising of awareness around the importance of peatlands. So peat is an amazing carbon sink the peatlands in the UK store more carbon than all the forests in Europe, and this landscape also supports a really huge range of biodiversity of rare birds, plants and insects. Let's have a bit of a listen to the flow country. Please, can you play the video? Um, and these listening walks were part of a residency supported by the arts organisation Cryptic in partnership with the Flows for the Future project and the RSPB who are restoring a huge area of blanket bog in the flow country. Um, but the reason I'm sharing these now is because this was the first time I decided to call these listening walks deep listening walks. <clears throat> and I invited people to listen at different depths to consider the time that is held within the peat. 10 metres of peat takes approximately 10,000 years to form. So what might it mean to listen together for long durations, to contemplate this depth and to imagine this large timescale? 
and think further into imagining geological time and to stretch the imagination towards the unknowable. Listening underwater and underground for long durations together, it's an invitation to find new ways of thinking and refresh our perspectives, consider our place on the planet and consider the impact of the Anthropocene. <clears throat> I'm reminded of Timothy Morton's concept of the hyper object, a term he coins to explain objects so massively distributed in time and space as to transcend localization, such as climate change. In his book, The Ecological Thought, he says, how to deal with the existence of hyper objects, products such as styrofoam and plutonium that exist on almost unthinkable timescales. These materials confound our limited fixated self-orientated frameworks. But the other main reason I wanted to call them deep listening walks was to refer to the incredible composer Pauline Oliveras, who made deep listening into a practice by encouraging unbiased listening unfiltered listening and she invited people to open their ears to the world. She presented an idea of a non-hierarchical connection between the human and the non-human and wrote a series of sonic meditations which she once called recipes for listening. One score reads in its entirety, take a walk at night and walk so silently that the bottoms of your feet become ears. Her sonic meditations places listening as a fully embodied pursuit of attending to sounds and to the world. And these sonic meditations are all open scores, a stimulus for improvisation. So during the last year, it was not possible to organize many participatory just deep listening walks, uh, but I did manage to do two and, uh, in Bristol. And I wanted to draw attention to the huge tidal range that flows into Bristol twice a day, every day which is actually the second largest tidal range in the world. And the tides occur because of the gravitational pull of the moon. And in terms of thinking on different scales and from other perspectives, this is quite a good starting point. This listening walk um, that I'm showing pictures of here was from Control Shift Festival last October, where I used wireless headphones so people could actually listen together in a socially distanced way, all to the same hydrophone feed. And I invited the harbour master to give us some further insights about how their team managed the high tides and keep the floating harbour at the same level, which was really fascinating. And also we became aware of just how much water is involved with this tidal flow and um, the management of that with the uh, floating harbour and the locks and the, the stop gates to prevent the city flooding every day. And this was interspersed with a gentle slow exploration of underwater sounds from different parts of the waterways. I developed this listening walk further for Outlands Network Joyous Thing Festival in February 2021, which happened during full lockdown. So I made this as a live stream using multiple microphones and a video from my phone and far too many cables attached to me. And that was broadcast live um, for this festival. And I was kind of interested to find out what this was like for the people to tune in. Um, and the walk happened at the cusp of day and night, starting 30 minutes before sunset and finishing 30 minutes afterwards. And I think one of the nice things was that it was live. So wherever, if you were listening and watching locally, you would also be experiencing that change in the light in your own, in your own environment as well. And I also did the walk at spring tide, where the high tides are higher and the low tides are lower. As the moon circles the earth, the point where it's closest to the earth is called its perigee. And three or four times a year, a new moon or a full moon coincides with the perigee of the moon. And this is called a perigean spring tide, which has an even larger tidal range than usual, reaching an even higher high and a lower low. And that's gonna be happening next week. More about that later. So this walk was shifting from listening from over water to underwater and being shared virtually. A shared walk together as the day changes tonight at an edge point of the city, where the Avon Gorge carves a chasm between the city and the woodlands. And I hope that we could all simultaneously be with the tides and their significance. And here are a few sounds and images from that location. I can play the next video, please, Martin.
And you can actually watch some longer extracts from this live stream and other recordings from the Control Shift Walk and other hydrophone recordings on my Swickton blogs, um, which are available at the Data Showcase and on the Swickton website. So I'm gonna move on to listening to water part three um, as another way into listening to water. So this is the River Froome, which is very close to my house. And my intention last year was to have deep listening walks along the River Froome, but I wasn't quite able to do that. Um, but I'm really interested in the Froome because it has a very interesting history. And actually, as it comes into Bristol, it gets culverted almost straight away. And it's mostly hidden under the city centre. It's been rerouted on many occasions. And so I was interested to try and reveal some aspects of the Froome through listening walks. Um, <clears throat> so as I wasn't able to do these, um, join together the people for these listening walks, I still wanted to create some conditions for improvisation and for conversation and to open up the possibilities for ideas and processes to emerge and find a new, win new way into different types of knowledge and to search for hidden or unexpected qualities. So I decided I would try and think about this as a collaboration with the river. And in the spirit of rewilding, I did not want to be fully in control of the outcomes and I wondered how I could embrace the agency of the river. So I began, I began by making some hydrophone recordings and listening to the water. And while I was doing this, I found myself wading into the river to listen to different areas. And it's discovered that small bits of algae and river plants and sediment from the river stayed with me when I waded out. When I was recording, I found myself wading into the river to listen to different areas. And I discovered small bits of algae and river plants stayed with me on the way out. So I decided to explore these materials and consequently made an attempt to reveal more about them through a further interaction with 16 millimeter film. So with the sediment and plant matter from the river, I brought them into my makeshift dark room and I laid them out directly onto the film and exposed them with a torchlight. And I then developed the film using eco-processing concoction called caffeinol, which is a recipe of instant coffee, vitamin C and washing soda which I've learned about from being part of Bristol Experimental Expanded Film Collective, also known as Beef. And I'd like to specifically thank Vicky Smith for sharing with me her caffeinol recipe and various tips and tricks. So this becomes a photogram film and the physical traces of the river particles affect both the visual and the optical soundtrack of the film, which actually offers up another opportunity to listen to the river. So on a 16 millimeter film, um, the edge that's opposite the sprockets is actually usually where the soundtrack is printed. And then that plays back on the projector as a light is shined through this optical soundtrack. So being as I've made this film without a camera, um, my river particles and, and uh, algae and plants have spilled onto the optical part of the film, which therefore when I play it back makes a different kind of sound as this kind of direct interaction of the materials. Um, and at this point, I wanted to just refer to Jane Bennett's book called Vibrant Matter, because the aliveness and the agency of the surface of the film has this direct contact with the wet materials from the river. And these materials interact physically and chemically, bringing about unique transformations that also respond to light and to temperature and to the grease on my fingertips and to many other factors that, of course, I'm not controlling. It actually has many layers of indeterminacy. Um, so this I particularly like this quote, which is about matter being vibrant, vital, energetic, lively, quivering, vibratory, evanescent and effluescent. In a world of lively matter, we see that biochemical and biochemical social systems can sometimes unexpectedly bifurcate or choose developmental paths that could not have been foreseen, for they are governed by an emergent rather than a linear or deterministic causality. So I became really aware that film is sensitive and it also collaborates. It responds back and it improvises. And I enjoyed embracing this indeterminacy inherent in the process. So I'm gonna play um, a very short one minute extract from a digital edit of this film, which is mixed with some underwater recordings from the same part of the river. But at this point, I'd like to point out that this film has got flashing images um, and it lasts for one minute. So um, if you need to, just listen, don't watch. Um, thank you, Martin. Can you play this extract?
So reflecting further on the process, um, this was my first darkroom experience. Um, and it is a very immersive space where my field of vision is reduced. And this actually reminds me of the act of deep listening, a different and unusual perspective and way of being. The darkroom enhances another sense, this time the sense of touch. And working with river materials in the dark reveals different kinds of knowledges about these substances and about the river. And I'm reminded of the idea of the haptic image and the aliveness of the surface of 16 millimeter film and how this can activate different, perhaps more multi-sensory or synesthetic responses, which have been discussed in recent online talks around the release of Kim Knowles' new book, Experimental Film and Photochemical Practices. She refers to Laura Marx's definition of haptic visuality, which is grounded in this dialectical movement from near to far, from solely optical to multi-sensory, where images seem to reach out and touch the viewer through their surface presence. So I then experienced editing the film on a Steenbeck flatbed editor for the first time, which was also a really physical process. And I was surrounded by lots of short strips of film hanging up in very low light while I scrolled through them on the, the film on the Steenbeck to splice them in or out of the sequence. Very, very different to digital editing, much slower and involving much more touch and different senses again. I first screened the analog film at Centre of Gravity exhibition in Bristol during October along with a beef event. I used a variable speed projector so I could speed up and slow down the film depending on the content. And I mixed the sound live between a combination of the river sounds and the optical soundtrack produced on the film. So I've now had the whole film digitally scanned, but this didn't include the optical soundtrack. So it's completely silent. Um, so this digital version, I wanted to further interact with. And so out of curiosity, I collaborated with digital artist and programmer, Matthew Olden, to explore methods to digitally read the optical soundtrack of the film. And he built me this amazing Max patch. Um, and I can't necessarily use my mouse to show you different parts of it, but on the left, the, uh, the bar beneath where you can see the image of the film, I can actually scroll around the film and I can read the optical soundtrack of the image as it's moving past at any point. So um, it's using a very similar principle to how an optical soundtrack works on 16 millimeter film, but with this digital tool, I can do different things and read it in any point of the film. And then Matthew also included an eight band EQ, which works by analyzing the image in eight stripes. So each band of the film as it's being watched highlights different frequencies on the EQ, depending on how light or dark it is. So it's mapping the image of the film into sound using different processes and different filters. Quite difficult to describe in words. So I recorded a little bit of a demo of using the patch. Please, can you play that? Thanks. So there is one version of this mapping of the movie on, on my website and on the Swookton Data Fellow website blog. So by bringing this digital mapping into the mix, there's a tension generated between the digital and the analog, bringing zeros and ones in digital processing into the mix. However, this process still embraces glitch and noise and aliveness. And I'm interested in playing with these aesthetics along with the analog film and soundtrack. So with all of these things, I'm working towards an improvised performance where I can play with these different materials and mappings and techniques and reconfiguring them in new ways each time. So those are the ways that I've been listening to water during my data fellowship. Um, and by exploring new ways of listening with other people and with the river, I've experienced different kinds of knowledge that I hope will give rise to new ideas and methods to improvise and collaborate with others in the future. And before I finish, um, I've just wanted to highlight a few things that are coming up that relate to this research. One of them is tomorrow uh, with Disappearing Dialogues, an artist collective in Kolkata in India who have launched 
waters of change. Um, and we're having a live conversation tomorrow and they've got a new website which is highlighting artists who use water within their work. On Tuesday, it's the highest tide of the year. So don't miss that, get yourself down to uh, look at the tide in Bristol, especially. Um, and Tidelines are doing an all day event, inviting people to share their experiences around the tides for over 12 hours. Um, and so there's information about that on this slide. In the summer, I'll be showing some artworks around water, including some listening walks and, and experimental image making at Wakehurst, which is part of Kew Gardens in Sussex. And in the summer, I'll be premiering a new piece called Literal with audiovisual artist Miriam Boucher. Um, and that is all around, it's a, it's a staged performance where we've built an interactive um, live set. And that's all to do with sea level rise Acts of, acts of balancing and unbalancing is a kind of reimagining some aspects of tipping point, but without the motorized controls. And this is for an ensemble in Ireland called the Quiet Music Ensemble. And then I'm working with the Rabbit Holes Collective, uh, which is part of the Bristol and Bath R&D on adaptive podcasts, podcasts with the BBC R&D. There's a lunchtime talk about that if you want to look it, look it up. And then finally, listening to nature. I'm very excited to be working with um, a science and music project with Ian Thornhill and Amanda Bailey, where we are using bioacoustic monitoring for the, um, uh, the Great Crested Newt at Newton Park on Bath Spa University campus. Um, so I would like to hand back now to Martin and I hope there's some good questions to answer and thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Cathy. That was great. And wow, you're, you're a busy woman. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Anyone wants to get in a question, put it in the chat now, but uh, we have got our first one, so I'm going to go dive right in. Uh, Shameful Spade uh, asks, what environments would you ideally like to record and what are the tech obstacles, if any? Um, well, I have been sort of following this kind of obsession with hydrophone recording, and I'm really looking forward to listening to The Great Crested Newt, um, which I'm going to be doing at Bath University campus. Um, I'm also very interested in uh, listening to, to ice and water in different states. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm always interested to listen to, you, to, to water and using hydrophones because it's always very unexpected. So I guess I'm quite interested in, in sort of finding unexpected sound worlds. Um, and the technical obstacles are, I guess, accessing these places. Um, and what's been interesting about lockdown has been you know, really, really working within my immediate local area um, and actually having a bit of a constant fascination with the pond in my garden. Um, and I guess with uh, hydrophones, there's always um, issues with how, how do I get to the middle of that lake to listen from a different perspective and different. So I have actually purchased myself an inflatable kayak. So I'm hoping to reach some more difficult to reach spaces, even if they're just uh, very, very local to where I am. Great. Well, I'm, I'm excited to hear what, what happens with the kayak. <laughs> uh, great. Uh, Rod Dickinson uh, has a question, uh, a bit more theoretical. Uh, does your interplay between analogue and digital processes privilege one or the other? And do you have a particular affinity for analogue or for digital? Um, I don't really privilege one or the other, but I really, really like to mix them up. I don't uh, yeah, I think there was a point where I was very, very analog and I didn't have any tech in my life. And then I started exploring tech and realized I really loved it. And then I got really over techy and I realized was that my computer way too much and I was missing actually touching and physically uh, working with things. So I think, I think more importantly, the analog has to be present for me. And I really like making and the physicality of making, but I can't resist um, I can't resist sort of weaving some tech in because I have a fascination with it. And I think I kind of love the combination of both of them because they have very different, um, they, they sort of give you very different reach and, and different ways of expressing things. And Tim Corkerton, following up that, uh, have you ever tried doing any ambisonic recordings? No, I haven't had the chance to do that no, before. Uh, maybe um, you probably might want to explain to some of our viewers what ambisonic actually is. <laughs> Uh, well, from what I know if about Amazonic, <laughs> it's um, when you use a microphone that's that's got that can actually record all around uh, sort of three hundred and sixty perspective. 
Is that right? I think that's right. Yeah, like it, it records in a full sphere, I believe, so you can hear up and down and left and right. Yeah, and I think get all the I think that is. Yeah, I think that's getting more accessible, and there are more sort of inroads and tools that are sort of less expensive ways to do that. So, um, I just wanted to sort of highlight an interesting conversation I had um, with a scientist. Uh, called Sophie, I apologise now just for forgetting her surname, but basically she's recording, researching um, ocean noise, and we had a discussion about hydrophones, and she's actually using this um, other way of uh, sensing um, sound and vibrations in water that is closer to how a fish might sense sound, because they actually, as well as sensing sound waves, they sense the particle motion of the water, and that's how they can tell what direction the sound is coming from. So, so she's been using some equipment with like three accelerometers to kind of listen to the particle motion of the water and also to be able to sense the direction sounds are coming from. Um, so I guess that's kind of underwater fish based ambisonics, maybe. I'm not sure. That, that, that sounds exciting stuff. Uh, yeah, questions coming thick and fast. Vic Tillotson uh, asks, uh, can you talk a little bit more about water and why you're drawn to it as a medium and a subject? Oh yeah, well, um, yeah, I love wild swimming. I like being in water and I think water, there's just, it's just so poetic. There's so many metaphors and it's constantly changing. You know, the rivers and the tides are all connecting up into different parts of the world at the same time. So we're kind of connected to everyone and the kind of scale of the currents uh, moving around the planet and the water cycle. I mean, it's just endless. Um, wonderful ways of thinking that can relate to water that I find really fascinating. Um, yeah, <laughs> I hope that answers that question. I think so, I think so. Uh, I had a question myself actually. Um, so a lot of your work is very you know, generative and predictable live. You're, you, you, you're producing these things which are never the same way twice. And then you seem to be moving towards like, you know, producing this film, which is just a physical artifact. It's a single mm -hmm. recording. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about, you know, what the difference between producing something that's completely unpredictable and different every time and something which is fixed. Yeah, well, the film that I showed in the talk is fixed um, because I've edited it and I've put it together. But that actual film has had many, already had quite a few different outings. And I did show it as lots of overlapping fragments on a whole stack of television monitors, also as part of Bristol last year, um, because I wanted to try and create something that didn't repeat and had captured more of that idea of, you know, the Heraclitus, you never step into the same river twice, that constantly flowing, changing nature of the material. And then my aim for the, the analog film is to use it as a basis for live performance where I change the speed of the film live and I mix the sound live. And I'm trying to look at whether I can mix between the, opti the actual optical soundtrack and then have a camera on the film and use that kind of digital mapping of the lights and darks to then further affect the sound. So I think, yeah, it is a fixed thing and it's edited, but I can't stop uh, sort of playing with it in ways that makes it uh, more live and less fixed. Um, but yeah, I'm not averse to having a fixed version of it. There is a fixed version of it on the on the website. <laughs> and how, how do you feel the the relationship between, I guess, a lot of people will who will encounter your work through recordings and fixed things on websites? And do you do you feel like they're getting a true sense of the work, or do you really have to see the live version? Oh, it's really tricky because obviously, in the last over a year, um, having sort of not really shown work in that way and with it being mainly live or installations that you need to visit to then kind of thinking about how can this be you know shared online or digitally um so yeah it's, it's a different a different inroad i mean i was interested with especially with the kind of live stream of the listening walk and i need to talk to more people who experienced it as to whether it did feel live um even if you're looking at it on a, on a screen and I think that was one of the main choices for doing it at sunset. So you could actually experience this change in your local space as well. Um, so I think it's, you know, we're still exploring ways in which it can feel live, but online. I don't know. Um, I, I'm quite interested in 
the potential of the adaptive podcast as well that I'm kind of working on with the Rabbit Holes Collective and BBC R and D because with those their um, podcasts which change based on external factors so it might be the time of day it might be whether you're moving or not moving or where you are or and I'm really interested kind of obviously to work with the tides or with kind of um, how close you are to rivers and water and I think there's something really exciting about the potential for these new methods of creating uh, changeable or non-linear um, stories or soundscapes or films that, that are adaptable and um, not fixed but in a kind of digital format great thanks i think that's probably all we've got time for i think a lot of people are going to want to hop over to um to hop in for the uh, southwest creative technology network data showcase so i'm going to say thank you very much kathy that was a phenomenal talk and, and some great insights in the questions there thanks very much for having me uh, before you all go i want to remind you that there is no talk next week because of easter we'll be back in two weeks time with watershed zone zoe rasbash She'll be talking about climate justice, the transformation to a green and equal society, and about the role of the arts and culture in achieving those goals. You can get news on all of our future talks by following us on at PM Studio UK on Twitter, at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram, or by subscribing to the newsletter on our website. Please don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel, press that button, give the video a thumbs up. The more subscribers we get, the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. And please feel free to share this link. Captioned version of the video will be available to watch again shortly after we finish up. And don't forget about the Southwest Creative Technology Network's data showcase, where there's a conversation about to begin about data and the environment. It's free to join, and there's talks and presentations on all day today on a range of topics around data. We'll pop that link in the chat for you now. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you all again here soon.